to the Planet Global Studies Center for Organizing Research and Fostering. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first panel. Uh, the title is Impacts of Climate Change and Adaptation in the Global South. Our first uh, speaker is Stephen Black, an associate professor of anthropology at Georgia State University with the BA in anthropology, anthropology, and an MA and PhD in anthropology from the UCMA. In addition to this, uh, to his collaborative and engaged research in Costa Rica, focus on planetary health, cultural sustainability, and indigeneity, Stephen previously conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Durban, South Africa, on performance, activism, ethics, HIV, stigma, and support, and global health. He has also studied global health resources in Atlanta, Georgia. He's the author of a Speech and Song at the Margins of Global Health, Salute Relation of HIV Stigma and AIDS Activism in South Africa. And please join me welcoming How much time should I take for 10 minutes? Okay, that's 10 minutes. I'll try 10 minutes. Yeah, that's a good, better, better idea. Tell me that. Uh, well, welcome. Thanks for thank you for including me in this panel and in, in the day's events. I'm excited to be here. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about um, a collaborative project that I did recently in um, Costa Rica, in an area in southern Costa Rica called Moruca. It's an indigenous territory, um, kind of in the mountains, but not too far from the Pacific coast. And actually, I think I have a picture here. So. It's one of, I always forget how many, where do I say this? 24 legally recognized indigenous territories, um, which are allocated to come up eight officially defined indigenous ethnic groups in Costa Rica. Um, so it's, it's not too difficult to get there. It's also not, not too easy. If there's a, a inter-American highway runs right past the community, actually it's a big, uh, issue of concern when the Inter-American Highway was first built in the 1960s, what would happen to the community? Um, because it brought opportunities, but also a lot of outside influences and potential problems. Um, but in the 1940s, about 75% of Costa Rica was covered by forests. And by 1987, about half to a third of that had been cut down. A pretty extreme uh, deforestation. But one thing that Costa Rica is famous for is, is reforesting. It's really made a, a huge effort to uh, invest in ecotourism and reforestation. Um, so I, now I think the statistic is that about 60% of the country is forested. So it's, um, it's reversed its, its problem with deforestation. But one question that you might ask about how does this kind of intersect with uh, questions of indigeneity and in particular indigenous land rights in Costa Rica? Um, so one thing that's relevant to know is that um, indigenous territories are protected by law and this law was created in, I want to say 1977. There was a law called the indigenous law and this um, followed closely on the creation of a national park system in Costa Rica. So, First, the national parks were created, and then building on that momentum, um, legislators used the same kind of model as the national park system was going to be, it, be based on to create indigenous territories. And I think as a result, indigenous territories, um, they account for about 50% of all legally protected lands. And most indigenous people live on lands that are more forested and better protected than non-Indigenous people. So the question of like how Indigenous people uh, relate to and connect to questions of reforestation and environmental sustainability is an important one, um, and whether or not they see themselves as stewards of the land. Um, so, but before I get to that, I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about methods. Because I think it's very important we're talking about the global south and, and that term has kind of implications built into it in terms of power relationships, right? Income, power, politics. Um, and so this project was uh, very much collaborative from the start and engaged. Um, I worked very closely, uh, co-wrote everything with uh, two Costa Rican colleagues, Carlos Ferron Guzman and Carolina Bolaños Palmieri. Um, we also involved two GSU students, Sandra Eng and Janet Perdura. Um, who worked with us. 
And then um, we, it was a long process of kind of getting, getting permission from the community to do this work, which involved first talking to uh, an indigenous elder. Well, I'll show a picture of him on the next page, Don Jose Carlos. Um, and then talking to the official political unit that controls or is in charge of the territory. And then working with them to identify 10 indigenous youths who were going to do the project with us. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture of the youth team that worked with our GSU students for two months on this project. Um, and we did something called participatory action research. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that. Um, I'm not sure that we followed it, you know, to the letter of the, what you're supposed to do, but basically the idea is that you're asking for input from community members throughout the process and have periods where you're stopping and reconsidering what you're doing and responding to those concerns. Uh, so one example of how that happened is we initially thought that what we we're gonna do is create this really vibrant online set of resources, videos and pictures and stuff on Instagram. We're gonna have a social sort of media presence about the project, uh, sharing it with everyone. We thought it would be very useful for ecotourism in the community. Um, and then speaking to community members, especially the youth that we were work with, they weren't very comfortable with that. It turns out that there was a history of people coming in and doing research in the territory, not consulting closely with community members, leaving and then sort of never coming back, not telling people what they had done, not sharing the results of their work with community members. And um, so as a result, most people were not comfortable with their um, with their faces being you know, put online. Um, and another thing that the youths were very concerned about was having their work um, clearly marked. So we created a photo booklet and we pivoted from doing this kind of online resources to creating like an ethnographic photo booklet as one of our kind of products of the research. And in that work, we were very careful to, um, you know, make sure we, we noted who each photo was, was by. So that was one thing that the youths were concerned about. They wanted to have credit for the work, make sure that their, their work wasn't being exploited. Um, a couple other notes about methods. Um, let's see, up at the top, we were consulting with um, Don Jose Carlos and his, his wife, um, Doña Leila. Um, they were very important in putting together the project and connecting us with um, community leaders. And I think I covered most of the rest of this already. Um, let's see, what else? I, I always like to show this picture. I think it's a really cool picture. Just, you know, in case um, people are thinking, when you start talking about indigeneity, indigenous communities, you think about like tradition, and sometimes there's these stereotypes that people bring to that kind of that understanding of what indigenous peoples are like. And these are some boys that are their shoes and their cell phones at a quinceanera. Um, those are pretty hip shoes, I think. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in, into shoes, but I think they look pretty cool. But, you know, um, kids were kids. You know, they were concerned with the same things that, that a lot of kids were concerned with around the world. But they were also dealing with how to maintain traditions within that context. Thinking about how, why is it that you know, why is it that I'm broken? What is it that makes me different? And how do I stay connected to that, that tradition? Um, so since I've got limited time, I just want to go straight to the question of indigenous land rights. So like I said, the indigenous territories were created in 1977. And one of the things about that law is that it said that only people, the land inside the territories could only be owned by indigenous peoples. Um, that got a little bit complicated right away because there were already non-Indigenous people living and, and thought they were owning the land in Indigenous territories. And the law didn't have any sort of way to compensate. There was no sort of compensation, no, no way to, to describe what was going to happen to those people that were already living on those lands. And it sort of festered for a while in some ways. And actually around the time that we were there, um, this conflict made the New York Times um, because people were protesting about land rights. They wanted to have, they wanted to get non-Indigenous people out of the territory. There were um, 
fights going on in, in some cases, and in a couple rare cases, murders. And so it was um, it was a serious concern um, for community members. And actually, we were a little bit hesitant to address the topic because you know we wanted to keep our students safe. We didn't want them to get involved in something that was going to lead to um, conflicts or anything like that. So, um, but inevitably, the the idea, the question of land rights did come up in our work. And one thing that we were surprised by actually was that maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but we were surprised that there was a huge amount of variation in the indigenous community on this topic of land rights and the indigenous law. And what we found is that this kind of corresponded, not very tightly, but it connected a lot to the different ways that people were making a living, what, what they were doing with their lives, maybe not surprisingly. So, um, there were, for example, people that were focusing on mask making. This is actually the largest source of income in the community is making these really vibrant, amazing masks. Um, it's connected to a traditional indigenous festival that happens at the end of December every year. Um, but at some point, tourists came along and, and realized that these were very cool masks and started buying them. And then people started realizing that tourists like this. And, so like these colors, for example, are not very traditional. These are like really acrylic, um, bright colors, things that people that are making the mass thing will appeal to tourists. So it's become its own kind of uh, industry. And in order to make these masks, people are harvesting uh, balsa wood from the forests in the territory. So um, people that were involved in mass making tended to be more pro-Indigenous land rights in, in favor of the indigenous law, because that allowed them to continue to make a living off of the forest. Um, and a number of people that were harvesting balsa trees were also involved in replanting balsa trees. So there were some efforts um, funded by the United Nations and partly by the Costa Rican government, by nonprofit organizations to provide funding for reforestation efforts and so some people that were involved in making masks were also involved in, you know, replanting the forests that they were cutting down. Um, this is just another cool picture of someone making the mask. Um, and painting a mask. And then just to show you that the, the way that this has kind of um, expanded outwards, this is in the International Airport in San Jose, which is about a six-hour drive away from the community, and you can find it a stand where you can buy the masks at about three times the price that you would in the community. And I don't know if anyone from has, has been to a Repamia in Avondale States. Yes. There are actually Boruca masks on the wall there, which really confused me because it's what a Venezuelan restaurant. So I asked the owner and he kind of said, yeah, I mean, I know we have this thing on the wall about Venezuelan mask tradition. Well, these are cooler masks. <laughs> <laughs> So it, you know, it's, it makes its way even up here to Atlanta. And, you know, people who know this, they're very proud of that tradition. Um, another group of people that tended to often support the indigenous law um, were people that made their living farming. So there are a lot of people that, especially after the pandemic, actually, um, more and more people um, returned to farming because other sources of income dried up. That, you know, mask making was not as lucrative when there were not as many tourists. Um, driving down to the, to the community. And so people that were making a living off, off of the land tended to um, support the law. Um, this is not relevant. Um, but um, there were also people that um, did not really, were not in favor of the law. And at first it was hard to understand why that might be the case. But for example, if you want to get a loan from a bank um, and you have indigenous land, no bank is going to give you a loan. And there's a very simple reason for that because the bank can't repossess your land if you default on your loan. So the indigenous law effectively was blocking people from participating in like land-based generation of wealth. Um, and so that was one reason that people we're not happy about the law. Some some people also talked about the ways that the non-indigenous farmers that remained in the area were being exploited, that they were very poor people often, 
that they weren't doing very well and people felt bad at, about the, the, the position that, that they were in also. Um, so I don't have like a strong conclusion about this other than to say that um, things are not always the way that, that you might think going in, you know, that if you're coming from outside the community going into your project, you might think initially, I, I definitely thought initially, oh, of course everyone's going to be pro-Indigenous. Of course, you know, that makes sense. You're Indigenous, you want to have Indigenous lands demarcated and separated out. Um, but that's not always necessarily going to be the case. That things are always more complicated than you're going to think it at first. And the last thing I will say about this, so this is Ganya Leila and Don Jose Carlos, who we worked with closely. Uh, Don Jose Carlos was actually, he was part of the creation of the indigenous law in the 1970s. Um, and he also went on to work with the United Nations on indigenous rights. And so we actually, we set up a conversation with him, um, like recorded a conversation and we're turning that into a chapter based on our conversation with him. And we asked him about this because we wanted to know, you know, like you were involved in the creation of this law. He's a, a big kind of pro-Indigenous rights person. He's been working on this his whole life. What do you think about all these kind of critiques that others are raising? And his kind of response was sort of like, well, yes, but, you know, I was there in, in 1977. If we hadn't had the law, there would be no Indigenous communities today. So I think his response was that based on his, you know, direct, intimate involvement, that it was a compromise. It was definitely a compromise to be able to pass the law in the first place. And that there were definitely all sorts of issues, but he stood by that as like being the right thing to do because it then enables us to have these conversations now and think about a way forward. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's about all I've got for now. Very interesting to hear about a, a country uh, that we usually don't associate with indigenous populations as Costa Rica, in contrast to countries such as Mexico, Guatemala, or my country, Peru. Um, I realized that I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> my name is Miguel, also with the uh, assistant um, professor of Spanish in the School of Foreign Languages here at the Red from Peru. Okay, our next speaker is. Uh, uh, Ubakar Mane, hope I'm pronouncing well, Ubakar Mane. He's the founder of the and CEO of the Smiling Coast Foundation. As a graduate of the American University of Anjou with a degree in human resources, he has dedicated his career to helping Gambians achieve their full potential. Under his leadership, the SCF continues to serve communities in the Gambia by increasing local access to education and basic resources as well as working to preserve the historic and cultural treasures of the Gambia while responding to the growing issues of global warming and its effects on infrastructure, housing, and access to medical supplies and services. Please welcome me to what our name is. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. I'm so grateful to be here. First of all, I um, want to thank the Atlanta Global Studies for inviting me here. And uh, special thanks to Shami Minifield for giving me this platform to be here. You know, I want to be there in person, but through the change of the weather, you know, I have been a cold and I hope you guys can hear my voice. You know. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce myself. Again, my name is uh, Buba Karmani. From the Gambia, uh, the Gambia is from West Africa, you know. And you know, for the purpose of those who doesn't who know, who doesn't know Gambia is from the West Africa. Uh, it's the smallest country in West Africa, and it's surrounded by Senegal, except the for its western coast, and it's on the Atlantic Ocean. It is between the both sides of the lower reach of the River Gambia. So the Senegal Senegal surrounded the Gambia. Uh, the three side of the Gambia, except the the other side, that is the Atlantic uh, Atlantic Ozone. But before going on a little bit, can you move this slide a little bit further? Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to uh, I would like to uh, tell a little bit about the Smiling Coast Foundation and uh, the Smiling Coast Foundation. That this is a Gambian non-profit organization, which is basically to increase the local education 
uh, and the basic resources. But also, we are working on many exciting projects just to improve the livelihood of the, our, fellow, our fellow Gambians. The foundation is focused on all aspects of education, such as uh, vocational training, and also uh, we're, using, uh, educational, we're using educational to help the people, uh, for uh, to help people with the scholarship. Because uh, as you all know, the Gambia uh, is a, it's a small country though, but it's, it's, it's a poor country though, I can, I can say. So our educational background is so low, this is why the Smiling Coast Foundation step up, you know, because uh, first of all, I would like to take the example of me. They say that education is the key for the success, you know, but then why is it hard for us to get our education? I'm from a poor family and I'm from a poor background. So uh, it takes me a lot to get my education. And we come with this idea because we feel like, you know, education should be, education should be, the key, and you know, it should be free for us to have our education when they say that it's a key. So this is why we come with the ideas. I'm, I'm the founder of Smiling Coast Foundation. So young people, we, we come together as young people to see how best we can use educational system, you know, to help ourselves in order to make the infrastructure, to develop the infrastructure of education of the Gambia. So this is why we come with this, uh, with this idea you know, we, uh, we come with the Smiling Coast Foundation, you know, to use the education system in order to promote the infrastructure and the development of the education in this in, in the country, Gambia. Can we move to the others? Right. Okay, this, uh, as I said, our, our programs goes with the uh, climate justice, cultural, cultural preservation, and ending poverty. So when we talk about the climate justice in the Gambia, as you can see, the climate justice is a is a global issue. You know, the Gambia is highly vulnerable to this climate impact and the climate change, which includes first of all is the flooding. You know, uh, the flooding is a very big uh, climate change in the Gambia because we can see the research have tells us that one level of sea sea rise in the Gambia. Uh, is in in emulate to eight percent of sea rise to the uh, uh to the land. So with that case, we can tell you that the uh the climate, the global warming can affect uh the food security. Also can also affect our tourism. You know because when you look at the Gambia, the agriculture is a is a main good. When, when uh, this is the, the good, this is the basis of the Gambia. When you look at the Gambia, you can see the agriculture uh, and the fishes is the main uh, main economical where, where we get our economical. So with this, with the with the global warming, it affects the educational. It, it affects the the sea, and also it affects uh, our our natural resources. Can we go to the next one? Right, this is flooding. This is the climate change affects the global warming affects the Gambia. This is our uh, 2022, right? The researchers have said in, the th in 34 years, this has never happened in the Gambia, whereby continuous of water coming to the Gambia, continue of raining fall with no stops, you know, continue to uh, pour in the Gambia, and this is how it looks like. You know what I mean? Uh, the government are playing an important role whereby they can uh, minimize this, but uh, we can say that their role is very, very, very limited. You know what I mean? So this is why the smiling coast, uh, the smiling coast have to step up. You know, this was the year 2022. We, what we did it in, in this period, you know, we wish we can help a lot, but with this period, we try, we try by all means to make certain kind of donation with international workers. We have our limited resources and we use our limited resources, you know what I mean, to, to make the family, because families are scattered from here. Families move from one place to another in order to, uh, uh, to live in a livelihood, uh, to live in a better life in this situation. So the Smiling Coast Foundation have to step up to make sure that the families live in a better life you know, the families giving food in this situation because this was a very, very disaster. This was a disaster in the Gambia 
And uh, as, as, as I said uh, backward, you said have said that in 34 years, this has never never happened to the Gambia. So this is a very big threat to the, uh, the global warming, the global change uh, in the Gambia. Right, climate justice, the Smiling Coast Foundation, well, yes, climate justice, the Smiling Coast Foundation also are uh, involved in the climate mitigation housing, medical supplies, food security, access to cleaning water and infrastructure, you know what I mean? Talking about the medical supplies, medical, as you know, uh, Gambia is a very, very, very poor country. Our medical, our medical, uh, medical um, um, our medical side is a very is very very low you know what i mean people are dying unnecessarily people are dying without medical help this is why the smiling coast foundation have to come up to step up you know what i mean you know we we have our what we did in this situation is like especially the, the period of covid 19 we gather we are uh, we got our small resources in order to help the medical supplies but my mission here is like my mission to the america here is We've been collaborating with uh, Big Dreams, which is also is a Gambian association from uh, United States, but based in um, based in the Gambia. We are making a little, we are making a fundraising whereby we can ship a medical supplies to the Gambia because our medical equip, our medical, uh, our medical system in the Gambia is very low, and people are dying. Uh, people are dying in the Gambia. So we, we, we feel like, you know what I mean, we need to get certain improvement with our medical supply. This is why the Smiling Coast Foundation are step up, you know, to make uh, to make little bit donations. You know, so we have a 40 feet container from the Messiah and then we are fundraising right now to try to take the medicine to the Gambia. So when we also talk about the food security, access to cleaning water, we are lacking of all this. The infrastructure of the Gambia is very poor. We are lacking all this. And so we are we are making uh, working with the global we are working with the global stories to make sure that uh, we have access to our clean water for our people and the infrastructure for our people. Uh, this is uh, our this is our museums in the Gambia. This is our uh, our museums in the Gambia. So we are also seek to establish a long term relationship with the Ministry of Tourism and Culture to build an international network for Gambian artists and culture bearing participate in cultural exchange and to uplift the Gambia as a cultural destination for other artists and scholars to continue to experience their return home to Africa. So still now when we talk about the cultural historical Digitizing the archive, uh, I have uh, I have opportunity to work with my namesake, who was a national griot of the Gambia. He was uh, 97 years before he died. He died like three years old. Now he's an ancestor, you know. He wrote books, uh, he wrote books more than 200 years back, you know what I mean? And the Gambia, as I said, the Gambia is, uh, is, is divided in, the Gambia is having like seven ethnic groups. The Gambia is divided into seven ethnic groups, and all those ethnic groups are home to the Gambians. You know, so my namesake is a griot and is a, he's a historian. He wrote all these books. You know, is kept in an archive, small archive. So I was I had the chance to work with him for two years, and the 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 mission of the Smiling Coast Foundation is to upgrade and uplift his work. You know, for the for the people of the Gambia, not only for the people of the Gambia, but the, the world in general, to see his work, you know, and then learn from his work. To work. This is why we are also working to create, to make sure that to preserve, uh, to preserve his work. The next size can source you, the next size also can source you the archive of my namesake. This is the well, name. His archives. That that's the storage for his heart. Oh, yes, so yeah, this is the uh, this is the story of the of uh, of of my name. See the name. How the book? How he kept the book? They're all hand typed on a typewriter. You know, and they so are this, they are the archives. Uh, of some of these books, some of these books are recorded in the recording. Some of these books are having uh the the record of all all, all tips. You know what I mean? And then all these books, some of the writing are uh with his right hand. With uh, with his handwriting, 
and they are all there. So right now, uh, what what before he died, the some of the books are, are expired. Some of the the writings are are not being shown. So we are trying to keep this uh this history. We are we don't want this history to be lost. We are trying to keep his this history. We are trying to uplift his history. We are trying to work with his family to make sure that all what he's what he wrote uh is all kept and is all uh for the uh for for remembrance for our people. This is his son. That's this his son, and this is the place called Janjambure. This is where we want. Uh, this is a historical site. As you all know, the history, uh, the slave trade of the Gambia. Most, maybe most of the people will gonna know uh, the uh, Punta Kinte. Punta Kinte is from the Gambia. It's from Jufre. You know. So, uh, so this is uh, this is also another spot from Danjambre. This is where uh, we wanna place the uh, archive, which which was uh, written by my namesake, you know, and this is the storyteller. This is storyteller there. This can tell you this the, uh, this this house symbolized the history of the Gambia. This house symbolized the slave trade of the Gambia. You know, as you can see down the down down there, it's having an uh, iron there. This uh these irons are all kept. These irons are there for more than 300 or 400 years, they are still there, and then they are showing how the slave trade was being built. So we are trying to make sure that to keep this history, we are trying to work with the village people. We are trying to work with the, the elders in this village to make sure that uh, the, 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 the histories over there has been kept. That's the name of my namesake before he died. This is me and him, you know, telling, uh, telling this story. And then telling telling me what uh, exactly what he he want us to do before he died, you know. And we have all that recordings, and we have uh, everything to digitize uh, his oral history, you know, of our elders in the in the in, in the region. Right. This is me. Uh, this is me with my uh, with with working with the communities. Uh, because uh, I can say uh, with the, the Smiling Coast Foundation during the it it all comes under uh, COVID, you know, D during the COVID, the Gambia, the Gambia is a uh, is I know the world, the world in general, you know, everybody was subjected to to that, uh, you know, but the Gambia was really really really, really subjected to uh, uh, to to COVID to COVID. So what we did uh, with the Smiling Coast. We raise money and we give hundred bucks of rice. We working with the community because one thing I know and one thing I do is that to work with the community. We work with the community. We give in each and every one of them back of rice. We select. A, we wish we can support the whole village, but we select a particular village where we go and then give them the back a back of rice to the village people and then make sure that you know me you know uh, the the people there can live for uh, during that uh, difficult moment. You know, so this is what we do uh, at the, at the moment, right? As a, yes, this uh, Smiling Coast Foundation also is, uh, as I said, we are also giving our scholarship to the uh, to the un unprivileged people. You know, as I said before, when they say education is very important, so why are they? Why is it hard for us to get that education? You know, so we are we we are we are, we are we are making sure that. The underprivileged people, the smart people, to get education, you know, to uh, to be the better future, you know, in in the future. And also, we are also using education not just to uh, just to pay for education. We are using education uh, to build our infrastructure development. We are using the education to uh, to build teachers training and capacity building. We are also using the education uh, environment environmental educational program. And also, we are also using our education system. To build uh free planting and reforestation, you know, because when you when you say the climate justice also, the Gambia also uh uh the Gambia also is affected a lot about the climate justice, uh, uh the, the climate change in the Gambia, especially deforestation. So this is why we also uh wanna come with the ideas, you know, to enlighten our people, to enlighten the youth, because we are mostly working with the youth, you know, to work with the youth to show them how uh, education is very important, you know, when it comes to climate justice, because awareness is very, very important in our in our society, in the Gambia. Well, I wanted to keep 
keep come to a conclusion. We're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to keep going through the slides, okay? Okay, okay. Is it medical supplies? Oh, there we are. Yeah, that's the last one, though. <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> yes. All right. Uh, yes, that's the smiling. That's the smiling. Uh, that's the smiling post foundation working with the uh, with the praise house. This was the uh, project we that we did with the praise house there in the Gambia. Thanks for Simon uh, Simon Minifield. And that's the main thing why I'm here to to learn and to gain more knowledge about the uh, his, uh historical preservation to make sure uh to uh in order for me to go back to the Gambia to work with our youth. And uh, you know to uh, to give them more knowledge about how we can preserve our history, you know, because that's the most important thing, and this is what we got. The Gambia is very very rich with culture. The Gambia is very very rich. Uh, is very very rich with the with the history, you know. So the most important thing is we have a history, and we should be learning to get more knowledge of how we can keep our histories. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll yeah. We will continue learning about uh, the Gambia. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Tremaine Minifield. The work of Tremaine Minifield is community based as her research and resulting body of work often draw from public archives. She served as the Stuart Rose Library Arts Residence at Emory University and was awarded the prestigious National Endowment of the Arts Our Town Grant to present her praise uh, house project at three different locations in the metro Atlanta area to celebrate the African-American history of each community. Her exhibition titled Indigo Prayers, a creation story, was presented by the Michael uh, Carlos Museum in 2022. Minifield currently serves as an inaugural constellations fellow with the Center for Cultural Power. She splits uh, her time in residence between Atlanta and the Gambia where she continues to study the origins of her cultural identity and indigenous traditions by tracing the green shows. All right. Pray time. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Um, greetings. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Okay, so I have five minutes to tell you about this amazing project that I'm really, really proud of. I received the National Endowment for the Art grant to erect my praise house. It first appeared in, in um, Oakland Cemetery, a word out of the 800 unmarked graves there. And before I presented that at Oakland Cemetery, I was stranded in the Gambia doing research on the tradition and origins of these, of the praise house. Um, 14 months I lived there <laughs> with my six-year-old, okay, and decided to go deep, just allow it to be an artist residency, an artist residency. Uh, Bubakar was my guide. We went to indigenous ceremonies, traditions, and I painted it in, in indigo as an invitation to my ancestors' memories into my body as medicine um, in direct response to George actually. Um, and that's how the Praise House, I came back inside of that prayer. Um, it became a sanctuary for the city. Folks came every day. Um, and uh, it was a style and an important time in our city's history. Uh, the cemetery where it rested was also the site of the uprising. It's a Confederate monument uh, that actually, after this Praise House was removed, so was it. So we recognize the energy that we are invoking real change in community. Um, it rested there and we consider it place making and place keeping. Uh, we are calling our stories in community without and having a conversation about freedom. Um, the ring shout itself, the full body group movement practice that um, survived the middle passage. Um, it was ceremony and celebration there but because of our circumstances, merged into many traditions, um, including, most importantly, our faith traditions. So our celebration was our prayer. We were recalling freedom. 
So this prayer, this, this word, we call that prayer in community. Uh, this is it resting at Emory University. Um, this was the first site of the National Endowment for the Arts grant. Um, we allowed, <laughs> we invited community to go with us to places of Sankofa, return, looking back in order to see forward. Um, so we did the same. We went to our first places of enslavement. My family is Fuquay, my family are Fuquay. So we went to Fuquay, Verena. Uh, we went into the archives of those who enslaved us and we found the, the first, the name of the first person to arrive. Um, but we are searching her path um, through the Slave Voyages database that lives at Emory. Um, and she was French. Um, she came here from France, rather, um, probably likely from Senegambia, Senegal and Gambia. Um, and I, in my creative practice, Beyond the Praise House even, I'm mapping her migrations all the way to my present life. Uh, so her descendants moved to Tennessee, then were moved to uh, Kentucky, and where my great grandmother was born. And um, and then I, and then my great grandmother moved to Indiana, um, and whole story there. Anyway, I'm mapping that story uh, for my own practice. But it is remembrance as a resistance. You know, I am I am resisting the erasure of time and circumstances that would have me not to know the connection for my origin stories or my tradition. I am resisting the erasure for myself. I'm inviting community to do this as we uplift memories and histories that, of places of erasure, like the 1906 Rates Massacre is the, is the final site for the Prince House of Rest. Um, so this is in, in Emory, not in slavery. This These are our intentions with the work. Education, art, programming, social justice, historic preservation. We're lifting up historic preservation in the Gambia all the way to the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Um, that's why Buba took me <laughs> to the Slave Port Village, all in the Gambia. There were six, six in a country the size of Georgia. Um, there's the River Gambia that stretches around the whole country. It was basically a dry river. Okay. So we are now, Bukar and I, are going to the Gullah Geechee Corridor, where we came to, where we came to. And we're celebrating and, re and researching, I say my grandmother's memories, but <laughs> we're researching um, all of those ways that we retain freedom in our body. This is the interior of the praise house. This is it at night. So the work is anchored in technology, also as resistance. We are not present in areas of technology. Even coming on this campus has been triggers for me to be free. Uh, so we are reclaiming and honoring even the ring shout itself as a technology that we invented out of our circumstances. Um, it was a full body rhythmic prayer, a whole other language that we created in plain sight to preserve our identity. We ended up with a full, a full cover feature in the New York Times where we took um, reporters all up and down the Delhi corridor and we were able to um, uplift the historic preservation of the families who now preserve these sacred spaces. So I want to tell you our story real quick. <laughs> I know I don't have a lot of time. Um, but the Emory Praise House was not planned to be the first. It was planned to be the last. I don't really know why, but originally it was planned to be the last. I was challenged to reach the funding goals myself. Uh, as an individual artist, I had to find the rest of the funding. I formed my own 501c3. I've been on the pavement, beating everywhere, getting sponsors, and uh, but it, nothing had come together for me to, to execute the other two sites. So when Emory was built first, I went to Emory and said, would you donate the structure? We had been told we couldn't build it as a modular. There were so many barriers. Everybody you know, to overcome the fear of asking that you're worth it, that you're, that you're worthy, you know, in every encounter, every meeting, you know, um, is to embody the memory of freedom, right in community, in the execution of the project. It is a very real healing that's happening. 
And my whole committee and Emory, they became my advocate. And they found a way to, build, to, to move this structure <laughs> like a praise house would have been done before. Put onto a flatbed and moved by crane from Emory University to a Freedman's Town, which is Beacon Hill where it rests today. And I'm going to skip to all of that and all of that I put in there. And I'm going to show you who look at that. There it is. A Freedman's Town. Beacon Hill, downtown Decatur. Most folks don't even know. It was once a Freedman's town. And all emotionally, live on social media, child. <laughs> we lifted the praise house onto a flatbed and with police escort and we and we drove it through town. And we told the story of how our ancestors did the same at emancipation. And in, in, in all cases figured out those folks who had built them. You know, we knew how to move our stuff. We played the game about getting <laughs> You know, and we took them to spaces where we could preserve them. And these were our government seats. This was our first institution. These were our healing centers, our sweat lodges. Okay? This is where we could be ourselves. And that in itself, in community, was medicine. And that's the medicine that I've just celebrated today and inviting into our bodies in community today. And I'm so grateful to have the anchor of family in Gambia to continue to support the work and, and the grant and funding from a grant to receive artists um, to Atlanta and um, take artists over to the continent to continue to do this Sankofa work. Thank you. Started in Costa Rica and Central America to uh, the Gambia, West Africa, and now we're going to Asia. Uh, our last speaker is Gregory Randall. Uh, he's, a system, he's an assistant professor in the School of City and Regional Planning here at Royal Tech. Uh, his research examines how local economies and organization patterns are shaped by major 21st century decisions, ecological, climate, energy, and demographics. He's currently writing a book on agrarian to urban transformations in India under contract with Oxford University Press and is a research lead for Future Works, a five year program on the future of work in the global south, funded by the International Development Research Center. Uh, please. Great. Um, this is a tall task to follow Charmaine. Uh, that was really inspirational. And uh, I'm going to take us down a completely different path now um, to talk about uh, this notion of a just transition, um, to talk about decarbonization and energy transition, and sort of how uh, this plays out against local realities um, in the global south. And I'll be, um, towards the end of my presentation, focusing on India as a case which is where I do most of my research. Uh, so this is part of uh, a, a global South research uh, program called the Future Works Collective. Uh, this is a group of consortium of research institutions and uh, scholars that are based primarily in the global South, uh, organized around this question of, of how the future of work, uh, the future of labor markets will look in global South economies. So we're working on a range of different issues, but one of them is uh, the question of decarbonization, energy transition, and how it plays out um, in labor and employment patterns in global South economies. So starting off, what is the, the just transition? Uh, this is probably a term that some of us are familiar with, but it actually originates uh, from the 1970s um, in the North American trade union movement. Um, and it, this term arrives in uh, the context of greater environmental activism, more environmental regulation, um, and concern among trade unions that uh, the adverse impact of this new regulation on certain kind of industries, fossil fuel industries, um, would have uh, negative impacts and ramifications for vulnerable workers and communities. So it's really a concept that said, if we're going to have this kind of large scale energy transition, we need to plan for um, its, you know, all of its impacts, including some of its unintended adverse impacts. Um, and over time, it's been sort of globalized as a term. It's been picked up by global institutions like the International Labor Organization, 
Um, and more recently, uh, it's been picked up as part of the COP process, the, the Global Climate Change Conferences. Um, so at COP26 in 2021, uh, a just transition declaration was adopted, mostly by countries uh, in the global north. And uh, I want to highlight sort of a few key elements of this framework because I think um, they give us an opportunity to reflect and also to sort of interrogate uh, whether uh, the sort of policy guidance that comes from these global policymaking processes is relevant and adaptable to sort of global south uh, realities. So uh, one of uh, the key elements of this framework is that the, the sort of global energy transition must involve social dialogue. Uh, and this is a sort of ILO term. It basically means that economic and labor market governance uh, has to uh, be negotiated through a dialogue involving governments, employers, as well as worker representatives, uh, which is generally meant uh, used to mean trade. So in the context of the energy transition, it basically means that the phasing out of fossil fuels should be done in partnership and in dialogue with uh, unions. Uh, another element of this framework is the idea that workers who are currently employed in fossil fuel industries can be sort of transitioned to new employment in green energy through skill development, that they can be retrained to work in sort of the new jobs of a restructured economy. And a final element of this framework is this idea, this aspiration that uh, the new work that people take up as they transition out of fossil fuel jobs uh, should be local. They shouldn't have to move to another place uh, to take up this new, this new work. So as part of this project, uh, we've been thinking through sort of a, a simple stylized framework for asking this question of how the global energy transition, uh, the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources, will impact workers and their well-being in the global south. And what this framework kind of attempts to illustrate is the idea that the sort of global drivers of this energy transition that we, uh, that we sort of spend most of our time focusing on in research and in policy making processes, uh, that the impact of those global drivers, right, climate change, but also uh, the advent of new uh, renewable energy, low carbon technologies, and the policies that are adopted to sort of accelerate and drive forward the adoption of those technologies. Um, that the impact of those global drivers um, will be sort of determined by uh, a lot of local conditions, right? A lot of contextual factors that really shape the way that these uh, sort of global forces are washing over individual societies and how people on the ground experience them. Uh, so we emphasize sort of existing labor market realities existing institutional realities, as well as sort of the constraints and opportunities of, of physical and, and economic geography. So coming back to this sort of just transition declaration, I think when we examine those local contextual factors, it forces us to ask some more critical questions of this, this sort of policy guidance that comes from the global institutions. So around the issue of social dialogue, we can ask, do existing employment arrangements even allow for this kind of dialogue between worker organizations, governments, and employers, uh, the way that is envisioned in sort of ILO guidance? Around skill development, we can ask, are there institutions that are capable of managing this sort of skill development transition in a way that is just and equitable? And around this aspiration of local work opportunities, we can ask whether sort of the existing physical and economic geographies even allow for or enable this kind of job creation in the same locations uh, that sort of the potential displacement from fossil fuel industry is happening. So to kind of illustrate the importance of these local conditions or contextual factors, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about India's energy transition and, um, and highlight sort of where I see uh, the, the inadequacy, really, of the global frameworks and policy guidance that we currently have, the current sort of discourse. So in, ter in terms of these labor market realities, uh, as I said, the sort of guidance from the Just Transition Declaration is that uh, the energy transition should be navigated through social dialogue. Uh, but what does social dialogue look like in a country where over 90% of workers are informal? Uh, where there is no sort of uh, representation of, of the vast majority of workers that can be involved in a social dialogue process. Similarly, or, or in addition, 
this sort of global framework that comes from the Just Transition Declaration talks about uh, this social dialogue involving fossil fuel industries as well as secondary industries that are also indirectly impacted by uh, the global energy transition. But the problem is that uh, decarbonization, you know, the energy transition is really a kind of whole of society, whole of economy transition that has cascading impacts. And so drawing a line and saying sort of these are the unique segments of the labor market that are impacted is very difficult. Um, and one illustration of this is uh, the case of the Indian railways. Indian railways are really important for facilitating uh, people's access to labor market opportunities because they provide basically cheap transport for low-income workers in the country. But half of Indian railway revenues come from transporting coal. And the reason why passenger travel is so cheap for low-income Indians, the reason why they can be used to access opportunities in the labor market is because of that effective subsidy. Right, so as in, in India transitions away from its dependence on coal, that will have an impact more broadly on labor market mobility. It can't really be limited to this idea of primary and secondary sectors. It will wash over the entire labor market. And this is just one example of those kind of cascading impacts. On the question of institutions, as I mentioned, this, this just transition declaration puts a lot of faith in the idea of retraining workers to take up new occupations in green energy sectors. Uh, but when we actually zoom in and look at a, a, you know, a real context of India, we see that, um, first of all, skill development is already a huge part of kind of the labor market governance of India. Um, the country has massive skilling programs that have now existed for a couple of decades. But those skill development institutions uh, are actually responsible in many ways for reinforcing a lot of labor market inequalities. Uh, because what we now have a lot of evidence on is that uh, women and other kinds of lower caste groups that are traditionally marginalized in the labor market through the existing skill development infrastructure end up getting sort of funneled into the lowest wage um, work that has the least sort of socioeconomic mobility. So it's a bit naive to think that we can put uh, these same skill development institutions in charge of managing a just transition into the new sort of energy sectors. And finally, in terms of you know, sort of physical and economic geography, we see even more complications with implementing policy guidance from global institutions, uh, mainly because of the geography of energy. So most of the renewable energy potential in India and where the infrastructure is already being built out is in the south and west of the country. Whereas most of the fossil fuel endowments are thousands of kilometers away in the eastern part of the so the idea that sort of the new uh, green energy employment can be co-located with the same uh, fossil fuel employment that's being phased out um, is, again, a little bit naive. And the other challenge here is that the South and West, where those renewable energy resources are, or potential, is also the most prosperous part of the country. So uh, the, the energy transition really has the potential to kind of exacerbate existing spatial inequalities in the country. So where does all of this leave us? Um, I realize that I, maybe this sounds very pessimistic about our ability to kind of navigate um, the, the climate crisis, the imperatives that it has created around energy transition, um, and then sort of looking at all of these social and economic um, impacts for vulnerable communities. So this is uh, you know, the beginning of a five-year research program, and we really felt that our first step was to kind of deconstruct the global discourse around uh, the just transition. So I hope to be able to come back and reconstruct for you a new kind of just transition framework. But for now, I want to leave you with a few kind of preliminary insights from you know, the work that we've done so far. I think the first is that we need to recognize decarbonization and energy transition as really a kind of, you know, to use an academic term, socio-technical transition that impacts all of society, rather than thinking that we can sort of understand its impacts limited to specific sectors or specific workers. Um, another, I, I think, important insight from these observations is that the frameworks we develop uh, as part of the just transition really need to be adaptable to local conditions. And that if we try to kind of rigidly operationalize some of this guidance that comes from institutions like the ILO or the COP process, we could unintentionally exacerbate some existing social and spatial inequalities, right? If we put our faith and our resources in 
skill development institutions that have a history of reinforcing labor market inequalities um, as sort of a rigid way of understanding how the just transition will happen, um, then we could unintentionally uh, sort of reinforce those existing inequalities. Um, and I think the final observation is really that, you know, the global energy transition is likely to confront real equity efficiency trade-offs that we need to talk about openly and honestly. We can't imagine that every scenario of our sort of climate policy and global energy transition is going to be a win-win. We need sort of better and more honest policy-making processes um, and democratic processes that are both adaptable to local conditions but also recognize the real trade-offs that this transition um, will involve. And um, I'll just leave you with one final thought, which is that the questions that I've been raising um, in this presentation are uh, sort of, they become immediate, clear, and obvious when we think sort of through the lens of the global south, and in this case, through the lens of India. But I also think that they're relevant questions to ask here in our own local context. Uh, I think we only have to sort of peel back one layer to see that the ramifications of climate policy and everything we're trying to do um, to address the climate crisis um, could play out very unequally, uh, even in our own society. So I'll just uh, leave you with that. And uh, I don't know if we have time for discussion, but uh, thanks to Stuart and the Medical Studies Center for the invitation.